Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ started a movement. He has watched as his church has been tested, tried, and tortured. But the most powerful pattern of the last 20 centuries is one of victory. Through the blood, flames, and years, he has not left his church in the dark. A beautiful light is dawning on the world, an eternal light from him who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who was and is and is to come. His bold words have echoed down through the corridors of time and found their way into the hearts and minds of men and women for 200 decades. Find out what Jesus has to say to his church as we look at the last recorded words of the Apostle John. Dear Church, the seven letters of Revelation. But number one, I want you to see that Revelation, the book, the letter, uh, is a revelation from God. It is from God. Notice the chain of communication that we just read. It was God the Father uh, gave the revelation directly to Jesus. Jesus then gave it to an angel. The angel explained it to John, and John writes it down to give to the church, to us. That word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. Apocalypsis, it means the revealing the uncovering, or the, the lifting of the veil. And through the book of Revelation, this is what God is doing. God is unveiling his truth to his people about the things that are to come and about Jesus Christ himself. Jot this down. Revelation is not just a book from God. It is a book for us. It is a book for us. Us. The purpose of Revelation is to show his servants what must soon take place. Why? So that his church is fully prepared. So that we are not caught off guard. So that we are not left unaware. So that we can live without fear, knowing that in the end, when everything is said and done, we can know that it is Jesus who wins. The lamb overcomes. Amen? All right, you guys got to help me this morning. You see, I believe that Revelation is not just a book about some far-off distant time, about some far-off people. Like I believe with all my heart that Revelation is a book about here and now and us. And someone asked me the other day when end times will come, and I said, sincerely, I believe that the end times are not coming. They're here. They're among us right now. We are living them as we speak. Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. Revelation is a book of blessing. Revelation is a book of blessing. As far as I can tell in the Bible, Revelation is the only book that promises a blessing to those who read it and obey it and take to heart what is written in it. The Apostle John was blessed to receive it. The church has been blessed to read it throughout the centuries. I am blessed today to read it out loud to us, and we are all blessed to hear it and to take it to heart. Now, fortunately, John didn't say that we had to understand everything about the book of Revelation in order to receive God's blessing. Amen? Because there are some mysterious things in this book that really probably can only be understood in hindsight as we look at fulfilled prophecy. But we can be blessed 
We are blessed by reading, by hearing, even if we don't fully understand. That's good news. Amen? Uh, Revelation is a book about Jesus. Jot that down. Revelation is a book about Jesus. Yes, it's a, it's a book that describes events and things that must take place soon. Yes, it's filled with wonderful imagery and symbolism and metaphors, primarily from the Old Testament. By the way, the more you know your Old Testament, the better you will understand the book of Revelation. But the primary focus of this book is this, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is the focus. Revelation is not just lifting the veil off of coming events, but is the, it is the unveiling of the person of Jesus Christ himself. It's all about us looking at Jesus and saying, here he is. Unveiled, not as he was, but as he is now and as he is in the days to come. You know, we read in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read the story of our Lord Jesus as he walked the earth. And we see his ministry, right, of teaching, of healing, of delivering, of loving people. He was veiled in weak flesh while he was here. He was humiliated by certain people. He was rejected. And the last view we have of him in the Gospels is the resurrected Jesus ascending back to heaven with clouds all around. But, but what happened after that? What, what, what is he like now? We need our eyes unveiled to see Jesus as he is right now. We need to read this book and, and have our eyes unveiled to how he is in his present glory and in the glory of him who is to come. If we catch anything else, if we catch, let me say it this way, if we catch everything else but we miss Jesus in the book of Revelation, we miss the book of Revelation. It's a revelation about Jesus. And Revelation is this. Jot this down. Revelation is a book given to John during exile. And this is really the point I want us to think about here today because in the book of Revelation, as it was given to John, it was God revealing his highest while John was most likely at his lowest. Let's read more in uh, John, Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 4. It says this, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. And it says seven spirits. Some translations say the, seven, the sevenfold spirit of God. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. John goes on to say this, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father to him. Be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. John's reminding us, I love this, just kind of at the outset of the book. He's reminding us about the power of the cross. The, through the cross, Jesus has loved us. Through the cross, he has freed us. It's through the, his own blood that he has washed us and cleansed us from the deep stain of sin that we were all born into and that we personally commit ourselves so that we can serve God our Father in a kingdom and be priest unto him. This is our new identity in Christ. This is our purpose in him. And it's all because of the love of God that was shown through Christ. Jesus on the cross. Amen? The work of Jesus on the cross for us is God's ultimate proof of his love. 
And he may give additional proof, but he will never give any greater proof. He loves us. And John's reminding the church at the very outset of this book of the power of the cross in our lives. Verse 7, he says this. This is so good. Look, or behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now, I think it's pretty clear as we read the scriptures, the prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament and all throughout the New Testament, it's pretty clear that Jesus is coming back one day. And I believe that he is coming back very soon on the clouds of heaven with all authority, with all glory and power to rule and to reign. And everyone will see him. Even all those who pierced him through their unbelief and through their sin. He is our soon coming king. Verse 8 says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, As we transition in this section, John's about to introduce himself and address the seven churches of Asia Minor. Verse 9. You still with me? All right. I, John, I love how he introduces himself, your brother and companion. In other words, he's in the boat with us, right? He is our companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance How many of you enjoy that word right there, patient endurance? That is ours in Jesus. Was on the island of Patmos. Everybody say the island of Patmos. This is where John was when he received this vision. He was there on the island of Patmos. Why? Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. We read in the history books that that John is actually the last living disciple of the original 12. And the others had been brutally martyred for their faith. And here on the island of Patmos, listen, God is about to reveal something very profound. He's about to give the highest revelation to John. As John may be in one of his most low, lowest situations in life. Think, of, think about this with me. It's, it's about the year 95 A.D. And John himself is probably about 90 years old at this time. And he had been banished to a small barren island in the Aegean Sea. The island of Patmos was like the Alcatraz of the Roman Empire. It was used as a prison island and functioned as a jail without bars. And John was exiled there, which included the loss of all his property, the loss of all his possessions and civil rights. And one historian said it like this, that the island of Patmos was marked by constant chains, insufficient food, sleeping on bare rock and in a dark prison cave. Does it sound like John may have been going through a difficult time? Why was he there, though? He was there because of his unshakable loyalty to the Word of God. And he was there because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, things may have looked bleak. Things may have looked really dark, painful, even hopeless. And maybe John was thinking to himself, is there really any future? Is there any future for the church? Is there any future for the gospel? But God is about to reveal his highest to John, even as John is in a very low situation. Look at this in verse 10. It says, John said this, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see. And send it to the seven churches. Then he lists them out. To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, 
and Laodicea. These are the seven churches that were in Asia Minor, or what's called modern-day Turkey today. And we're going to learn from what Jesus said to each one of these seven churches over the next seven weeks. But in verse 12, he continues, and he says this, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Everybody say seven. Seven's an important number to God. It represents completeness or fullness. He said, I turned and saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of of man. Now remember, the more you know your Old Testament, the more you will understand the book of Revelation. When he says, like the Son of Man, it's actually a re- reference to what Daniel prophesied. I believe it's in Daniel chapter 7, but it's not a derogatory term. It's not a, it's not a term of really humility. It's a term of a great ruler who comes with dominion and power and authority to establish a kingdom that will never end. So he says, I saw someone like a son of man. We know that this is Jesus Christ himself. And now he says he was, he was dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. And now John's going to, starting in verse 14, he's going to give us seven, everybody say seven, seven descriptions of Jesus Christ himself, his features. Verse 14, he says, the hair on his head was like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all of his brilliance. My goodness, this is a, a profound revelation of Jesus Christ himself, an uncovering, a lifting of the veil of the person of Jesus Christ. And I ask you today, is there a greater revelation that he could have received? No. This was the greatest revelation, the revelation of Jesus in all of his glory. I want you to think about this because we don't need to miss this. This is how Jesus was, was clothed. He was wearing a robe down to his feet. Right? This, was a, this is the clothing of a priest. It reminds me of what it says in Hebrews, that we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way, but he did not sin. His hair was like white as wool and, and, and snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. And John here is seeing Jesus' purity, his holiness, his passion. His eyes are all-knowing and always watching. And his feet, they were refined like uh, burnished bronze. Everything was and is under the strong rule of the feet of the king. The description of his voice is, is much like what Ezekiel described in his book. His voice was like the sound of many waters. In his hand were the seven stars. And we'll see that these stars represent the seven angels or the seven messengers of the churches. The sword of his mouth is the truth of the word. It's a double-edged sword. It's active. It's alive. And Jesus later says in Revelation chapter 2 that he will make war with his enemies with the sword of his mouth. And we see that Jesus' face shined like that of the sun. The righteousness, the holiness of God shone brilliantly from the very countenance of the Lord Jesus himself. You see, everything in this vision of Christ speaks of complete power, complete authority, complete strength, complete majesty, and complete 
righteousness. The Jesus that John saw is the reality of Jesus today. The Jesus that will be coming back very soon. Are we ready for him to return? Verse 17, he says this. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This is John speaking, remember. John had walked with Jesus while he was on the earth for nearly three years and even leaned upon his chest. And now he sees Jesus not as he was, but as he is. And seeing him in his glory, what did he do? He fell at his feet as though he was dead. Now, I love what Charles Spurgeon, an old preacher, a teacher of the Word of God, said. Look at this quote. It's up on the screen. It says, Blessed position. We are never so much alive as when we are dead at his feet. And he goes on to say this. It matters not what ails us if we lie at the feet of Jesus. Better be dead there than alive anywhere else. It goes on to say in Revelation, Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. Everybody say those words with me today. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last I am the living one. I was dead, and now, look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Listen, guys, this is good news for us today but as we live in these end times. We do not need to fear. Amen? We do not need to fear. Why? Because Jesus is the first and the last, because Jesus is Lord of all eternity, from the very beginning to the very end, and everything in between, he is the sovereign Lord. We don't need to fear, because Jesus is the one who lives. Though he was dead, he is alive now and forevermore. Jesus is the one who holds the keys to Hades and death. And listen, I don't think Jesus is ever going to let the devil borrow those keys. Friends, what an incredibly high revelation. What a glorious revelation that was given to John at one of his most lowest points of life. Verse 19, you still with me? Write therefore what you have seen. And what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. How many of you are appreciative that Jesus just goes ahead and tells you what these things mean, right? He says this, the seven stars are the angels, or I think better translated, the messengers or the leaders of the church, of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so in the next couple chapters, Jesus has a message for each one of those seven churches in Asia Minor. And that's what we're going to study over the next seven weeks together, because listen, a message to them is a message to us. An encouragement to them is an encouragement to us. A, an admonition to them is especially an admonition to us. So it's important that as we live in these last days that we take note of the things that Jesus says to his churches. Let us have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church today. Let me tell you this. If you're at your lowest today, maybe you're at a low point in your life. Maybe you're dealing with a storm in your life. Maybe you're dealing with such intense pain 
and struggle and heartache right now in this season of your life, let me encourage you today. Let me remind you that God often reveals his highest at your lowest. Why? Because you're listening and you're paying attention. And your heart is humble and your heart is teachable and you're ready to receive what he wants to share with you. Let me encourage you with these three action points to take away today. Write these down if you're taking notes with me. Number one is this. Be grateful for every opportunity you have to stand on the word of God and to testify of Jesus today. Every opportunity, every chance you have to take a stand for the word of God and to tell other people about what Jesus has done for you, be grateful today for every time you have that chance. Be like John. Even if you're going to be banished or exiled or get in trouble by someone in authority, be bold. Be confident. Know that God is with you and that God is pleased with you when you stand on his word and when you testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be bold, be faithful, even if. Amen? Number two, I would tell you this. Draw near to God in prayer especially in this season, especially with what's going on in our nation, especially what's going on in our world, make sure that you are a person of prayer. Make sure that you are not neglecting your private time with God. Make sure that your prayer life consists of more time than, <coughs> excuse me, than just for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. As you draw near to God in prayer, he will draw near to you. Listen, in this time that we're in right now, you need to know God in prayer. Why? Because it's in that place of intimacy with God that you will receive the inner strength, the inner confidence, the inner assurance to know that Jesus is Lord. And that he is sovereignly working all things together for your good. As you look to him, he will be the one to give you that inner strength and that inner courage and confidence that you need. Not only that, listen carefully. Look to him for your outward guidance as well. In your place of prayer, ask God, would you lead me? Would you guide me? Would you give me your specific direction on how to prepare for the things that are to come, especially in our nation? God wants to give you specific instructions for your life and for the lives of your family. And he will do that as you seek him in prayer. And number three, I would end with this, refuse to live in fear. Absolutely reject fear. Fear should not be a regular part of our lives. It is not something that God gives us. God's word says, for he has not given us a spirit of fear. But what has he given us? A spirit of love and power in a sound mind. So reject what God has not given and embrace what he has. Amen? Refuse to live in fear. I just want to ask you today, are you at a low point? And I want to ask all of you online joining us at church online or on YouTube, are you at a low point today? Because if you are, I want to encourage you that you have a choice. Man, it's very easy to look the other way and to turn away from God during the most difficult and most painful times. It's easy to do that. Probably no one would blame you. You're full of questions and maybe anger like, God, where are you? God, I thought this was going to happen, but it didn't happen the way that I thought. 
And it's in those times that we need to remember that you and I are not God. You and I are not the fourth member of the Trinity. It's not the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and you. He is God. And we are his servants. And so always, in those most difficult times, we have a choice. We can turn away from God. And when we turn away from God, we turn away from our life. We turn away from our healing. We turn away from our direction. But my friends, and my prayer today is that we would always be a people, even in the most difficult times, that we would turn to God. Because when we turn to Him, we find what life is really all about. We find the help that we need in times of struggle. And we find out that he does reveal his highest when we are at our lowest. Turn to him. Turn to him. Never away from him. Amen? Do not live in fear. Draw near to God in prayer. And be grateful for every opportunity you have to stand on the truth of his word and to testify of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?